The obligations set out in Common Article 1 to the four Geneva Conventions and in Article 1 of the first Additional Protocol is composed of three core terms. To respect, to ensure respect, and in all circumstances. The first term, to respect, does not raise any particular problem. This is only an application of the general principle pacta sunt servanda, according to which treaties are binding upon those who ratify them and must be applied to those parties. The second term, to ensure respect, presents greater challenges. What does it mean to say that the states are obliged to ensure respect for IHL? There is at least a consensus that states must ensure respect by all the persons who are under their authority, including not only their armed forces, but also the civilian population. In principle, there is some margin of discretion in choosing the measures by which to ensure respect for IHL. However, that margin of discretion is limited, in particular when IHL obliges them to take some specific measures. For example, states are obliged to disseminate instructions regarding IHL to their military forces and encourage the study thereof by the civilian population so that IHL is known to their armed forces and general population. Another example is the obligation for states to search for, prosecute or extradite alleged perpetrators of serious IHL violations irrespective of the military or civilian nature of those perpetrators. This is part of what is called the internal dimension of the obligation to ensure respect. However, there is no clear consensus on whether the obligation to ensure respect also has an external dimension in the sense that it would require any state to ensure respect not only by all those under their authority, but also by others that are party to an armed conflict. The prevailing view is that the obligation includes an external dimension. According to this view, states are bound by both negative and positive obligations. The negative obligations are obligations to abstain from doing something. They include the obligation not to encourage or not to aid or assist other states in violating IHL. The positive obligations are obligations to do something. In particular, states are obliged to do everything feasible in their power to ensure that parties to armed conflict respect IHL and induce compliance in recalcitrant states. It is clearly an obligation of means and not of result. The obligation will not necessarily be breached if the violation does not cease. It will be breached if the state did not do everything reasonably in its power to bring the violation to an end. The scope of the obligation therefore depends upon a variety of parameters, including the capacity to influence the erring states, what is itself dependent upon the geographical distance and the political links between the concerned states. Finally, common Article 1 to the four Geneva Conventions and Article 1 of the first Additional Protocol also indicate that states must respect and ensure respect for the conventions in all circumstances. Those last terms, in all circumstances, actually reaffirm a number of fundamental principles. Firstly, it reaffirms the abolition of the Si Omnes Clause, a provision which was contained in past convention to the effect that those conventions were only applicable if all belligerents in a given conflict were party to it. Secondly, it confirms that IHL may also apply in peacetime depending on the obligation in question, such as the dissemination of IHL to the armed forces and the civilian population. Thirdly, it reinforces the strict separation of jus ad bellum and jus in bello, with the application of IHL not depending on the specific circumstances in which force is used between states. Lastly, it reaffirms the non-reciprocal nature of IHL treaty, which means that states cannot suspend or terminate the application of their obligations as a response to prior violations 
by another state party.